Welcome to the Convergence Coaching Inspired Ideas podcast. Join us as we explore great leadership and management ideas that apply within the accounting profession and in other aspects of life and business too. Hi, this is Jennifer Wilson with Convergence Coaching and welcome to Inspired Ideas, a generous leadership. We chose this session for a variety of reasons, but most importantly because we think generosity is such an important leadership attribute. Uh, When we thought about who should be our guest for this session, it was really easy for me to determine right away that I wanted to invite my friend and colleague, Amy Vetter, because she and I have had a lot of conversation about generosity and generous leadership. So, Amy, maybe give a brief introduction of yourself here, and then we'll get into it. Great. Yeah, I'm so happy to be here and also discussing this important topic as well. I am the CEO of the B3 Method Institute. I also own a yoga studio. I'm a CPA yogi and a technologist. I do keynote speaking and advisory work. That's great. Thanks. And I love the sort of eclectic but super integrated (laughs) career you've built. I mean, it it gives you a lot of different perspectives, I think, and uh, not just as an advisor to firms and organizations um, and somebody using technology and seeing how it can transform businesses, but also as a small business owner. I think that's a you know, just a super cool mix of perspectives that you bring. And so I'm really glad to have you here. Uh, We start every single podcast with the same question, and it's what inspires you most about your work. So why don't you share a little bit about inspiration with us? I've always found inspiration in what we can do. How can we make things better? Uh, You know, there's always somewhere to go in this profession I have found I know when I first started out, I had a very limited view, started out in audit and thought that was, you know, going to have to be the path or nothing. And I think really, you know, being open to learning rather than the destination is really important because as you learn about new things that are happening, whether it be technology, whether it be cybersecurity, whether it be accounting standards changing or you know, we get hit with a pandemic and and what do we do? Um, There's all these new roles and opportunities in the profession all the time. If you keep your eyes wide open and go toward what excites you rather than trying to go for a title. Yeah. So, you know, you teach a lot about mindfulness and that sounds like almost like mindfulness on the path, right? Like I'm going to pay attention to learning and pay attention to the journey and the discovery maybe, and not so much be so focused on that destination that I end up screwing up and not taking a path that opens up instead. I love that. Well, and I think, you know, that was definitely my path. I started out thinking I wanted to be a partner in a CPA firm. I did a TEDx talk on this. And when I actually got the job, I was like, wait, (laughs) (laughs) So so I just stay here now. This is what I do. And so, uh, you know, that was kind of one of those eye opening moments where, and I think a lot of people starting their careers, no matter what you do, you stay very focused on a path. You don't look right or left. You don't look at all the other things happening. And then, you know, you have those moments where you're like, okay, is this what's serving me? Is this what's exciting for me? And then how do I use the expertise that I have, not lose it, not give up on it and really keep my eyes open to what all the other opportunities I could go in and be okay to step back when you need to. So there's many times in my career that as I've pivoted that I've said, you know what, I got to take a step backward, learn it, learn the job before I can move forward into leadership positions I might have wanted later. Yeah, great perspective, though, though, the whole idea of learning. I'm a learner, too, so I can relate. And I also found myself a partner in a CPA firm, and I also had the same, <laughs> the same like, uh-oh, I'll be careful what you ask for. Um, so cool, interesting connectivity. So um, so the subject of this is generous leadership. and And I guess my first question of you is, you know, why do you think generosity is important? And maybe why don't you think we hear about it more? I think it's the same thing when we use the term soft skills, 
people are like, ah, oh, I don't need to do education on soft skills. <laughs> And it sounds light, um, but it's actually some of the most important skills that we need. I mean, outside of work, inside of work, communication and generosity, really important tools to better understanding the people around us. And I think too many times we make wholesale opinions about people based on our past experiences, based on maybe where we have insecurities as well. And we immediately size people up and I, I can be the same way. And it's learning to pause before you make assessments of other people and really have a one-to-one -one approach of understanding what each person needs to be successful versus a one-to-many approach and people dropping out as that happens because it doesn't fit the way they learn, the way they grow, the way that they'll be most successful. So the goal to me in being generous is that we are creating an environment where people can succeed. And if it's not an environment that doesn't fit them, then we do it in a very nurturing way of finding the right path out to something else that will help them as well, not just dropping them. But what kind of career path will help them and guide them that way too. Interesting. I have never thought of it this way, but I just heard in what you said, an element of generosity is like one size fits all is efficient. You know, we're running a big machine here, you know, that whole way of thinking, but making space for that individuality and being generous enough to, to do um, and create one size fits one development and career pathways and all of those things is, is a definite form of generosity. And it takes time. This is probably more in public accounting and this is just my opinion, but in corporations, there's a lot of focus on leadership development and so forth. And um, in public accounting, you know, with client deadlines and demands and everything else, taking the time away from billable work to actually nurture a career path is a lot harder, um, especially if you're in traditional types of firms where you're on the billable hour still instead of project-based you know, value billing. But I think it's really important to think about how as a leader, if you are leading a team, if you are um, even a coworker that wants to be influential and lead, it doesn't mean it's a title, leadership is really about not being the subject matter expert. It's about helping somebody else achieve. And too many times I think that gets confused a lot in a lot of workplace cultures that the leaders are doers, not actually, um, you know, and what we're talking about with generosity, that they're taking work off their plate in order to help their team grow. Yeah, so instead of doers, enablers, or empowers, mm -hmm. um, developers, you know, we, we would call them developers of others. Yeah. Yeah, great point. Well, so what other attributes? Let's, let's make a list together. Let's try to think of, like, if we were going to say generosity in leadership looks like this, you know, these are the attributes we might see. What would some of those things be, do you think? And I'll try to think of some, too, as you're talking and see if we can come up with a good list for our listeners. Okay. Well, I think I'll start with transparency. Um, that, you know, when we hold information, whether we intend or not, people will take their perception of why you're holding that information. They're not good enough to know it. They're not smart enough. They don't have the right title to know it. They'll make up things about what that is when it's really uh -huh. something not that big. <laughs> or um, you go through change management and you're not being transparent about what your goals are and what you're trying to achieve and allowing the group to give you feedback during that process. So when we eliminate transparency, we actually eliminate the process of people being excited and happy in their work and being a part of the process where uh, when we open that up and we're more transparent about what's working, what's not working. So even as a leader, when I think, you know what, I'm not doing so hot right now. Like what I had planned the work is not working. So let's get together and figure out why it's not working so that we can, you know, figure out a new plan together. But when you become transparent like that and 
I would guess there's some authenticity in that as well. People buy into you more as a person rather than seeing you as a separate entity. For sure. So, so you and I, before we started the list, started a list, and and you came up with it. You came up with developer and empower, and then you just had transparency and authenticity. I'm going to add to the list if I'm transparent and authentic, like in the example you gave, and I admit I don't know what I don't know, or that I made a plan that doesn't work. Then I'm vulnerable. So, so you know, generosity shows up as vulnerability. Um, you know. I'm open to feedback. You said that too, or, or at least alluded to the idea that as a generous leader, I am um, not only willing to give feedback, maybe risk our relationship and give feedback, but more importantly, I want to uh, get feedback. You know, I'm open to change. I guess myself would be another attribute. What else? What else can you think of that we might put on this list of generous attributes? Emotional intelligence. So um, I think it can be an overused term and I, and I would even kind of coincide it with unconscious bias um, that a lot of times, you know, we don't understand the experiences that people are having because they internalize it and the outward emotion we see or maybe digging their heels in the sand or whatever that is, um, there's probably some layers there to dig into versus just assuming what their issue is and um, then branding them for that. And so a lot of people feel stuck in a brand that they can't control. And if you're really being more open as a leader, more generous as a leader, then you are actually coming to a place of understanding of what their experiences are and why they're reacting the way they are so that you can help them course correct. Yeah. So the empathy part of, uh, you know, the social um, and relationship management pieces, you know, uh, social awareness and relational management pieces of emotional intelligence. It sounds like you were talking about there. There's some simple ones, simple attributes that maybe we think are so um, simple that they're given um, and one is, uh, as a leader, giving away credit. Mm -hmm. You know, there's that saying, um, you know, give away credit for the things that work and take responsibility for the things that don't, and that that's a generous leader. You know, so that's another thing I would put down. What do you think of that? Yeah, absolutely. I, I think it's the same thing as saying thank you. Gratitude, uh, what, yeah, huh? Because that... <laughs> You know, too many times we get so busy and people feel that they aren't noticed, especially in these times where we've had so much change. And it's a question to step back and ask yourself, who have I thanked lately? You know, who have I appreciated? And it's a small thing. Um, it's yeah. a little thing that, that, that you give, but it will go a long way. People will remember that longer than a raise. I agree. Gratitude. Um, we probably need a whole podcast on it. And, and, and I, um, I, I often think that maybe gratitude is something we all feel and few express. Yeah. I know that it's true that, that there are curmudgeons or whatever that don't feel grateful or entitled or whatever. But I think most of us as leaders do, do have the feelings, but we do a terrible job of making sure other people get how much we appreciate them. Right. Like, how, how comfortable are we to share our emotions with others? When you come back to mindfulness and awareness, it's really um, taking those pauses in your day to be aware of what other people are doing for the benefit of your workplace. And then when you stop and pause, you're like, wow, like they're really coming through for us, you know, in ways that we couldn't have expected. Yes, I agree. I was just thinking that, you know, earlier you talked about being transparent and part of the example you gave was sharing a problem maybe, you know, like mm -hmm. I don't just, I'm not just transparent with good news. I'm transparent with bad news or challenges or concerns that we have, things that aren't working. And, and I think that that level of generosity where I involve you in my challenges or problems without being a whiner and without being, you know, um, you know, o overly problem focused, but I, I let you in on them and I ask for your help and your support and I share innovation 
opportunities. I share problem solving opportunities. I share, you know, th that's the stuff that causes people to make leaps forward and also blow you away with what they are capable of when you didn't know it. If you let them in mm -hmm. and, uh, and give, give them a chance to share what they think and, and, uh, and share the problem, share the load. I have found that that's been some of the, the finest moments of growth and also big wow moments with my people that I work with where they just have blown my mind when I can finally just say, I'm stuck or I really don't know what to do. Yeah, and with that, I think it's not sometimes always business. You know, I remember when I started out in accounting and in my career, everyone was like, you know, personal and business is very separate and you shouldn't meld the two. And I have found through my career, when I am more personal, there's stronger bonds um, with the people that I'm working with. And not everybody's comfortable with doing that. So it doesn't mean this is a one size fits all, but for, you can take little steps in, which, you know, are things I had to do over time. You know, I remember, uh, when I started yoga in my early 30s, um, I wouldn't tell any CPAs I did yoga because I was like, oh, they're going to look down on me um, for doing this. Yeah, that's they're too gonna... zen. That's too... Yeah, it's hippie. Yeah, too new age. Yeah, and then in my yoga class, I didn't tell anyone that I was a CPA. So um, I had a class where I was teaching a yoga class and a client walked in and it was like, oh, you're the teacher? And then started talking about, you know, whatever business stuff. And then I see all the students sitting at the front going, wait, you're a CPA? Like, my husband's a CPA. My, you, know, this, you know, it started like this whole conversation. And then I realized we were bonding over things that we would have never bonded before. There was new business because of it as well. But um and those are, you know, not the intention, but the after effect of that. But I think you become more human and then people start sharing the things that they love to do. And when you learn about what other people love to do outside of work, you see that spark happen with them. Yeah. And then you can start thinking about as a leader, how do I take little bits and pieces of what they love to do outside of work and bring it here somehow? you know, so that that spark comes into the workplace and that bonds them even tighter. Yeah, I love that. And, um, you know, when we teach relationship development, we call that personal and professional rapport. You know, you're supposed to have both. And sometimes we just try to keep it all business and just have professional rapport. And we always say that that makes the relationship shaky. I mean, it's, uh, it's sort of like a two-legged, uh, you know, um, stake, you've got to have both personal and professional. And I agree when you can find those connect points, you know, it just uh, bonds you better. It just makes it, um, you know, longer lasting. Mm -hmm. Well, so what about, um, you know, we're talking about generosity and leadership and the reason we're doing it is because maybe people don't pay attention to it. They think it's too soft. Uh, but also, I think you and I have bonded on generosity mm -hmm. and leadership. Uh, we've certainly had more than this discussion on it. And, and we've done that because we see sometimes cultures that don't have generosity. Um, or or it, maybe it's not intentional that they're not generous, but they're not. So maybe we should talk for a minute about, you know, some of the things where we see it missing, uh, signs that it's missing or or, you know, things that leaders do that make it feel not generous? Well, I think a big example right now, and not to shame, but if you weren't taking a pay cut as a leader during this pandemic time so that you could figure out how to help your staff, it's, it's those little things. Like, you know, so if they're seeing you're still having these big salaries, and they're struggling to keep their jobs or, you know, you're reducing their pay because of budget issues, which is all okay to do, but you're not doing it for yourself. Those things are remembered. Um, and it, it creates unrest. It creates gossip, um, which is never something that you want in the workplace. So, you know, you want people to feel like you're in it with them. doesn't mean you know, you have to destroy your life, but it's learning to be selfless 
with some of the decisions that have to be made in the business in order to keep it going. And that has been um, a really hard part of staying in business right now as a business owner. Um, you know, I've got employees, I've got contractors, and the sacrifices that have had to be made so that their lives stayed intact through this. Yeah, I think earlier you talked about transparency and how if you don't tell people things, they make up their own, you know, kind of ideas. And, and we always say in the absence of information, people make up their own and it's almost always negative. Yes. And so, you know, um, it's possible leaders are taking pay cuts, but they didn't disclose it and uh, or they've stopped mm -hmm. draws or they've reduced draws. And, you know, we always say if there's going to be some um, some bad news happening, uh, you know, the big dogs eat the dog food first, uh, the leaders take the hit first. And so, of course, you cut your pay or you cut your draws and you have to be transparent that you did it. And you have to tell them maybe what percentage, especially if you're asking them to take a percentage pay cut. And by the way, your pay cut better be the same or more <laughs> percentage wise. Yeah. Uh, and um, and then you want to tell them when you're going to revisit their pay cut or their hours cut or their whatever, and and you'll be clear about when you're going to revisit yours too as a partner group. Um, I agree with you. That's a uh, that's a real um, you know vivid example that we're seeing right now. And some firms have been super transparent about it, and that was their first action. And others um, quiet maybe, and and we don't know what that means, and neither do their people. Uh, what other um, sort of less generous acts can you think of or, or cultures that don't feel as generous or leadership actions that don't feel very generous? Well, I think going through change management and doing it behind closed doors, period, becomes selfish and people make things up um, as they go along. And when you're pushing at people to change without giving them the education that they need and investing in your team that becomes very selfish, right? It's like, well, you, you just need to figure this out. And what happens in a human psyche is like immediately I'm going to uh, think I'm not good enough, that I'm going to lose my job, which then creates other behaviors, you know, that kind of uh, imposter syndrome, all of that stuff, right? So it's really important that if we're going to create change, and even in a time where we had to force change really fast, where did we pause and say, we're going to invest in you? We, we see what you're going through. We see what we are putting you through. What do we need to do to invest in you? And it could be right now, I have a manager at my yoga studio that, you know, she was really working around the clock to keep things going. You know, she tells me she needs to take a weekend trip right now. She's taking a weekend trip. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. I'm not saying it's inconvenient for me. I'm saying she needs a break. She's on burnout, you know, and so, what do you do? I mean, right. yeah. So there isn't, you know, always a way for everything to be convenient for us, the ones running the business. Um, you know, as much as we would like to say, no, we're in charge. This is the way it's going to be. Um, you know, it's really seeking what each person needs, whether to get that mental health back to get the education that they need. They need different hours so that they can feel better. I mean, right now, over and over and over, I'm hearing burnout, mm -hmm. you know? And yeah. um, so what do we do to help someone that's on burnout so that um, they're not in the point of exhaustion? Yeah. Well, and I mean, there's so much in that what you just said. And, and one of the things is like, she says, I've got to go and it's not convenient, but who are you going to be about it? Not just say, okay, go, but okay, go. I care about you. It's okay. We'll cover. Or, you know, all right, if you have to go, we'll, you know, make do without it, you know, and all of that. Like I could make, either make her make feel bad feel or yeah, I could uh, shame them or, or guilt them, or I could, you know, embrace them, not physically, but, you know, with, uh, with acceptance and empathy and compassion and, and let them have it and recognize sometimes as a leader, I have to take on more over here um, so that they, you know, the others are okay. And sometimes they'll take on more. So I'm okay, you know, mm -hmm. and, and I'm willing to risk the investment, you know, like, okay, I'll take it over here. And, and maybe someday I'll need you to take it over there, but I'm not going to, 
um, wait till you prove it to me. You know, right. of course I'm going to give. Uh, so that that was one thing I heard you say. Another uh, that I I don't know that it was kind of a nuanced idea in there was um, the the concept that uh, as leaders we have to recognize that sometimes maybe it is too much. And uh, and I know I'm I'm guilty of this in our organization. You know, I'm, uh, we're innovators and we're content creators and we're up to a million things. It feels like sometimes and and when everybody feels um, pushed to the edge, you can sometimes generosity looks like backing off of the ideas, saying, okay, let, you know, what are we going to cut? What, what are we going to pause? What are we going to table? What can we back burner? Let's not say yes to everything because, you know, that makes us a mile wide and an inch deep and makes, um, you know, makes every, the elastic tight and somebody's going to snap. Um, so I think that's another generosity trait is the willingness to stop and say, we thought all these were good and they are good, but they're killing us. So what, what can we give up? And, uh, sometimes that means trimming the client base. If capacity doesn't fit the client base size, um, sometimes it, uh, looks like, um, you know, maybe changing an initiative launch date, or just saying we're not going to do this service line or this industry initiative right now because we just can't swallow it. Right. And I think sometimes as leaders, once we feel like we start something, we can't turn back. Or say it's not working and can it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, if, if, if yeah. there is something you keep pushing against and it's not working, you can take the best parts of it to take into your next thing of your learnings, but you don't keep throwing money at something and pushing something that's, that's not working. Right. Well, and um, we have a concept when we teach leadership called um, selfish interest. And it's, um, and I think this is an emotional intelligence idea, but I haven't seen it sort of written into the emotional intelligence frame. And it's this idea that I am in touch with what my selfish interest is in all transactions, like what I would like to get out of it. Right. And so, and then I, I'm not just in touch with it and aware of it myself, but willing to disclose my selfish interest. So, um, you know, you and I have been doing these Friday lunch chats, which has been super fun. And, um, you know, you were hosting them on StreamYard and saying, hey, they're going up on my YouTube channel. Do you want to take a turn? Uh, you know, you're, uh, I, I thought that was like, you know, generous and I hadn't really thought of it. And, um, you know, I had it, I mean, I, I guess I wasn't caring, but you know, I'm sure my social media folks were, yeah. <laughs> and, uh, and, but I mean, uh, you, you know, like put your hands up and said, Hey, you know, I'm getting a benefit here. And would you like the benefit too? Which is, I think a generous act and mm -hmm. it's just being in touch with it and disclosing selfish interest and disclosing when you're going to get a benefit out of something and trying to figure out how to make sure other people are getting that benefit um, sharing conflicts of interest. Those are hard things to do, but I think that they really are some of the most powerful. What are your thoughts? Well, and, and I think it goes back to not assuming what someone else is thinking um, and being okay with asking the question because uh, a lot of times you may think they're being mad, they're mad at something that they are, they're not, or that, you know, or maybe they have an issue about something and they don't feel comfortable to bring it up. Gloria Steinem, she has a quote that says, um, when you're a leader, listen as much as you speak. And when you're not, speak as much as you listen. Because what happens is that as people rise through the ranks, people are afraid to give feedback. If you don't open the door for it, if you don't um, allow people to feel that that you are open to the things that they have to say or the mm -hmm. issues they're encountering doesn't mean you always have to agree with it. You know, you can say, well, you don't understand, like I've got these five other parameters um, that it's coming into my decision and you're just seeing the one, but at least it opens the conversation for them to get a better understanding of why you're making the decision. You're just assuming they're moving forward with that decision, but they might be angry about it, you know? Um, yeah. so it's opening up the door for someone to be able to ask you the question, but then it's the awareness of what you're hearing, what you're seeing, the body language, you know, and I've definitely encountered that, especially this last month of reopening. And there are definitely opinions 
of how I should have done it or what they wanted to be done versus what I did, but they also don't know all of the other concerns I have as a leader um, mm -hmm. to do it. And then when you start um, having to make different decisions and then maybe you made a decision, but as it's rolling out, you're like, well, we might have to shift this decision or find another way so not like staying hard to a decision, you have to keep that awareness open of feedback even when someone's not comfortable to verbally say it to you. Yeah. Well, and, um, and this idea of selfish interest in getting feedback, mm -hmm. most of us don't wanna look bad. That's, that's one of the four areas of selfish interest they, they, uh, you know, that, that we've uh, taught about is looking good, which doesn't mean necessarily having a great haircut. It means more like, not looking bad or being held in high esteem or seeming smart or capable or something. And um, sometimes we don't want feedback because we don't want to, we feel like it makes us look bad, but it right. looks bad not to get feedback. You know what I mean? So right. you're going to, you're going to have a, a crisis of, of mistakes if you don't get feedback, that's the bottom line. But, um, and, uh, and so I think that that's a, a really great example of, you don't always have to take it all, but you don't even know what people are thinking if you don't open it up for them. Right. And, um, you know, so anyway, I think this idea of selfish interest is one that we all have to pay attention to and be careful of because most of us are trying to protect our time and we want to look good and, we, we don't want less money, you know, we don't necessarily want more money, but when stuff costs us money, uh, you know, that can, that could be a concern for some. And I think we have to watch what we're protecting. That's what I always tell leaders if they want to improve generosity. Start looking in every transaction and every discussion, what am I protecting? Mm -hmm. and, uh, and maybe if I stop protecting that, we could have some sort of a breakthrough in thinking around this thing. Or if I tell people, here's what I'm afraid of losing, or here's what I'm afraid of happening, right. which is again, that transparency and vulnerability that you started with. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Well, we're coming to an end of our podcast and, uh, and uh, I'm really excited to ask you these questions. Uh, one of which is, uh, you know, um, perfect for you today because you're in a t-shirt with a saying <laughs> on it. Uh, so uh, we have these quick fire questions we always ask. And uh, one of them is if you, ha if you had to wear a t-shirt for one year with, uh, you know, one word or a phrase on it, what would it say? Well, I am wearing a word today that says karma, but that actually probably wouldn't be the word I'd wear for a year. Um, so I picked a word this year, which has really come into play, and that was release. I had a lot of change in my personal life and couldn't have ever predicted how much change was going to happen in my business life at the same time. And it was really about not holding on to any preconceived notions of what my life is supposed to be or any kind of opinions or thoughts that I had of what I'd want to do or not want to do. And it was more about releasing all of that and going and being curious, just being more open to what's coming. Who would have known <laughs> when I picked that word um, that, you know, uh, as a keynote speaker, the conference industry went down and, you know, the yoga studio has gone through a million changes as well, the profession. But then there's that release of, what I thought the year was going to look like versus now what will I do and, and what changes and what have I learned through that of, you know, different opportunities and keeping my eyes open. Yeah. What's possible right yeah. at the end of the day. So I love it. Release. Um, if you knew you couldn't fail, what would you do or what would you undertake? Be a soap opera star. <gasps> <laughs> I love it. I absolutely love it. My gosh. I always for, wanted to be a soap opera star. I've been watching General <laughs> Hospital since I was, I don't know, a toddler. So, I mean, they get their hair done every day. They have new clothes. It looks like a fun job. It probably is the hardest thing ever to memorize new lines every day like they do. <laughs> Yeah, well, but, their, but their role changes so little day to day that it's yeah. probably maybe close to the same lines. So uh, would you be a good guy or a bad guy villain, or would you be in between one of those that does, is good sometimes and bad at other times? Oh, that's a good question, because those characters are always a little more interesting, but I want people, 
I, I think I'd be a complex character. I don't know if it would be bad, but I think complex is a good way to be. <laughs> yeah, okay, a little of both, maybe. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and, and you don't want, you don't want the word bad in there, but let's, yeah. I like complex, that's fine. Yeah. Usually uh, it's a little of both. I think that's yeah. fine. I have to tell you that that's my <laughs> most original answer to that question. <laughs> And it really got me. me I love it. I mean, I absolutely (laughs) love it. The authenticity of that and um, and originality. And that I think those are two words that I would always use to describe you, Amy. Uh, Authentic uh, and original and um, and just fantastic. I'm serious. I. I really appreciate the opportunity to collaborate with you. I can't um, tell you how happy I am and how grateful I am. And on behalf of our whole team and all of our listeners, thank you so much for your generous sharing of your ideas on generous leadership. And uh, thanks to all of our listeners. You know, we appreciate your feedback. And if you have any for us or for Amy, please be sure to share it. Thanks, everybody. Thanks for listening to the Convergence Coaching Inspired Ideas podcast. Be sure to visit convergencecoaching.com to join the conversation, access show notes, and discover our fantastic bonus content. If you enjoyed this podcast, please subscribe and leave a rating and review. Have an inspired day.